Sometimes to get leaner, you have to eat more. It's true. A lot of times I'll train a client and the problem isn't that they're eating too much. It's that they're not eating enough. Here are the warning signs that you need to be the person or you are that person that needs to eat more to get leaner. What do you guys think they are? What are some of the, what are some of the red flags? Like, oh, I... Stalled progress. Yeah. Stalled progress right. is not getting stronger, yeah. um, which would be con- their calories already really low. That yeah. would be the biggest red flag for me, right? It's like you get that client and they have 20 pounds to lose. You have them track their calories and it's like 1500. Yeah. It's like, oh, we, we got to, yeah. we got to fix We're this. We're in a really low place. Yes. The, the truth is, and I know you're going to go through your, your, your signs, but later on in in my career i've found that this became this became the go to for everybody no matter what this became most of the rule right yeah it just rarely ever if ever i'm trying to think of recall of a situation later on in the back half of my career that i got somebody who wanted to lose fat and the first thing i did was go into a cut i don't yeah. think i ever yeah. did after that i think once i figured out mm-hmm. What mo- you got to build first because most people and it. obviously there's a bit of a bias, right? If you hire me as a trainer, you've probably already tried a lot of things on your own or tried other diets, tried other workout, and so I'm getting you after you've exhausted all your own resources, and now you're finally going, okay, I'm going to pay somebody to to help mm-hmm. me do this, and so there is a bit of a bias that I get people. It's rarely, rarely ever did I get a client who I look at their diet and they're eating, you know, 8,000 calories at McDonald's every day. And they're like, hey, I don't need to lose 50 pounds. And I'm like, oh, cool. This will be easy. You just switch out the McDonald's for like some chicken breast and some, <laughs> some broccoli. And we're going to get <laughs> ripped, right? That never happens. What you get is somebody who is struggling with weight loss, have for uh, years or most of their life and exhausted all their own resources. And they go, Adam, I, this is what I'm eating. And you assess it and you go, Oh my God, we're 50 pounds overweight and you're eating 2000 calories well, a day. For, for people listening, it was like, okay, this doesn't make sense. So, uh, f- okay. In order to lose weight yeah. uh, or, or lose body fat, or I will say that in order to lose body fat, your body has to burn more calories than you take in, or you have to take in less calories than you burn. But there's two sides of that equation. One of them is the calories you take in. The other one is the calories you burn. And the calories you burn side, there's two ways to approach that. One is to try to move more. The other is to try to influence your metabolism so it burns more calories on its own. That's the approach that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. That is the best, most sustainable approach because if I can if I can give you a faster metabolism, like right now, if I could snap my fingers and fix obesity, that would be the one thing I would do, would be give yeah. everybody a really fast metabolism. Like your metabolism <laughs> wants to burn more calories. And in order to do that, we want to build muscle, we want to build strength. And in order to build muscle and strength, you have to feed the muscle and strength. You have to give it the nutrients it needs to build. And this means oftentimes you need to eat a little bit more than what you're eating and definitely eat more protein. So if you're like a lot of people struggling with, with, with weight, you're trying to lose weight and you've just, you've gone through the cycle of eating less, doing lots of cardio, eating less, doing lots of cardio, and you get some success, but then you plateau and you get out of it and you're like, screw it. And you've done this cycle three, four, five, six times. A better approach is let's get my metabolism to speed up. How do Mm -hmm. I do that? Build muscle and feed myself more. And now this was a difficult thing to convince clients of early on. Oh, yeah. I mean, even initially when you kind of drop that as the opening statement, like I could just picture people, what defies the law of thermodynamics? Like I don't don't understand. Like, And I think that um, that's just been so conditioned to – to the general public so much that like we just need to burn calories and we need to immediately address what the biggest problem is, is losing the weight. Uh, when in fact, like building the body up and really like setting yourself up for long-term success so much better. Well, there's a bit of a misconception around fat loss and body fat percentage also. So you're right. Uh, we, we're not defining the law of thermodynamics when it comes to in order to lose pounds of fat, you need to be in a caloric deficit, right? It's just, that's that's, that's science. It's a fact, but it is not necessarily true for reducing your body fat percentage. So you can, though, however, take somebody who is at 20% body fat and bring them down to, say, 16% body fat and not lose weight. Not lose weight. They Just can build, muscle. They can add muscle and put nothing but good lean body mass on, and their body fat percentage will go down. So inevitably, changing I'll, their- I'll their, give a simple example. This, this is a ridiculous example, but it makes the math easy, right? If somebody was 100 pounds- of lean body mass. So, you know, muscle, bone, organ, like non-body fat weight. So hundred pounds and they had 20 pounds of body fat on their body, they would be 20% body fat. If that person gained a hundred pounds of muscle, 
wouldn't happen. But again, this is just easy math. If they gained 100 pounds of muscle, they'd be 200 pounds with 20 pounds of body fat. They are now 10% body fat. Okay, so your percentage of body fat is a percentage yeah. of your all body weight. It's so if you do this right, if you do this right, what ends up happening is either your weight goes up a little bit or it doesn't go up at all. You lose some body fat, gain some muscle, or it goes up and your percentage actually goes down. And now you have a faster uh, metabolism. But oftentimes this is the case. Oftentimes when people are, are struggling with weight, uh, it's oftentimes be, be, they've tried losing it many times. They've tried the burn and the cut, you know, process many, many times. Their metabolic rates aren't that great anymore. They're not burning very many calories. They don't, they don't, their metabolism is now slowed down as a result of that. And so what we need to do is we need to set them up for long-term success. Like, could I get someone to lose weight by having them cut their calories in half and handcuffing them to a treadmill? I could. They're going to also lose muscle. They're going to slow their metabolism down even more. And it's not going to be sustainable. They're going to gain it back because they live in a world where they're surrounded by food and they're not going to be handcuffed to a treadmill all the time, or at least I'm sure they wouldn't want to. So why don't we approach this with a, let's boost your metabolic rate uh, instead. Let's speed up the metabolism. Let's add some lean tissue, which by the way is good for you. Muscle is uh, where you store glycogen, so you have better insulin sensitivity. It organizes your hormones in a way to where it's more of a youthful hormone profile. It adds mobility, right? If you gain five pounds of, of good muscle, you're more mobile because you're stronger. You feel better. It looks different on your body. Five pounds of muscle on your body, especially if you sculpt it and, and target the muscle, means you have better shape. So it's not like <clears throat> I gain five pounds of muscle and it goes in my belly. That's what body fat does. Yeah. If I gain five pounds of muscle and I'm trained the areas I want to develop, I'm just going to have better developed uh, areas that I've worked on. So it looks different. It looks better. Speeds up your metabolism, but you got to feed it to do so. And, and in order to do that, you got to sometimes, oftentimes, eat a little more. Now, of course, we want to eat calories that are coming from whole natural foods. We want to make sure it's high protein. So there's more within the context of that diet. But yeah, you got to bump your calories oftentimes to get yourself leaner. You can't just keep cutting your calories. You own a pair of uh, handcuffs at home? No, <laughs> for the <laughs> treadmill. I was, I was curious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Not to mention a factor. the sustainability uh, and, and then also the psychological part that goes into this. I mean, man, I don't care uh, how metabolically healthy you are or not. Uh, when you reduce calories, you're hungry. And at that feeling of like, oh my gosh, yeah. like that's, that's, I don't care how healthy or not you are. That doesn't go away. Like if, and I always remind people that like when you're in a cut and they're like, yeah, I'm really hungry. Yeah. That's normal. That's a very normal feeling that a lot of people, and that can be tough, especially when you're not seeing the results you want versus telling a client, Hey, I want you to eat when you're hungry. I want to feed you, but I want to make the right choices. And we're going to feed this metabolism when you, and if you're strength training, we're choosing whole foods, you're hitting your protein intake. I rarely have to tell a client that I need them to limit their calories. When I have to have them to limit their calories because they're eating processed food, they're eating junk, they're eating out of bounds, they're yeah. not choosing whole foods. But if I tell them, listen, if you're hungry, I want you to eat. Just make sure the meal is protein centric and it's whole foods. But hey, eat if you're hungry. And as long as we are strength training in conjunction with that, I have never got a client fat. No. They have only built mm -hmm. muscle and only sp sped their metabolism up. So, but, but remember that is not like, oh, just go eat whatever you want. It's no, it's eat within the context of whole foods and prioritizing protein. And you don't have to feel like you're restricting and you're starving the body, especially if you pair that with solid program. By the way, the way that I would have to sell this to people, because I wouldn't tell people right out the gates, like, I'm just going to make you eat more. Cause they'd be like, I'm not hiring you. That doesn't make any sense. I would say to them, we're going to do strength training and I want you to hit this protein number. And what I knew about that was they were going to have to eat more in order to hit that protein number. They're going to have to chase something that they're not normally used to chasing. And they would always come back and say, my God, I feel like I'm eating so much food. And I'm like, perfect. Let's mm -hmm. just stay here for a second and let's continue to strength train. And then they would build muscle. They'd build muscle. They'd build muscle. They'd get stronger. They would notice people would comment and say things to them like, you're losing weight. And they'd come to me and say, you know, it's weird. My coworkers keep telling me I, lo I look like I lost 10 pounds, but my the, the weight on the scale hasn't moved. And I'm like, well, your body composition is changing. You're looking leaner. You probably are leaner, but you've gained some muscle. Let's just stay the course. And then you get this amazing snowball effect. Do you guys remember this? When you're working with a client and you're looking at probably three, four months in of them trusting you, following the process. And then all of a sudden they come to you and they're like, well, I don't know what's happening. I'm just getting yeah, leaner. It's weird. This is really weird. Like I, I've normally had to struggle for this to happen. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm getting leaner. It feels like my body fat is falling off my body. Yeah. 
what is happening. What a great place to be and a much more sustainable place because metabolic is, their, their metabolism is humming and they can get away with the weekends, uh, you know, going out and going out to dinner and going on vacations versus the restrict model uh, where, you know, you have one, one week vacation and you gain five pounds because your metabolism was so slow, yeah. you know, makes it really, yeah. really challenging. Instead of forcing it, you know, you're working with your body. It's, you're working with your body. It. It's, so, it's so much more of like a freedom to that, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, but, but again, it's, I think people are just like unaware that this is, this is really the best uh, formula for you to, to apply, you know, right from the very beginning, even with, you know, the, the, the urgency to lose weight. It's the psychological piece yeah, that makes this very so, psychological. so. Speaking of the psychology, I got a, a funny story for you guys. So, have you guys ever seen those studies where, like, if a if a man says hi to a woman, versus if a woman says hi to a man, the the perception that they have, <laughs> whether or not the person. Is oh, I've seen oh, like funny memes me. around that. Yeah, yeah. Like with the guys like assuming that he likes. I mean, what is it? It's the stripper loves me uh, condition. It's, so there's a, there's <laughs> this is they've done studies on this, right? So like men, if a woman just says hi to him uh, or anything, then he's oftentimes going to assume like, oh, she totally likes me. Yeah. And and yeah. women don't yeah. assume that at all. Yeah. But men almost always will assume like, oh, she likes me. It's because we deal with more rejection. Yeah, I, yeah maybe. And I, I think the theory 100%. is, the theory is that you would we, think though, if that was true, that we would think the opposite. Wouldn't exactly. You think if, if, well, if they're coming, they're, they're being nice and they're like hi, and they're going out of their way to say hi. Like, well, like, she's not. <laughs> this is gonna be easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah she's not, That's my end. She's dude. not telling you me. It's like to go away. I feel like though you would think because we we were rejected so much that we would actually think that like oh she probably yeah, does. It's probably like every yeah, other chance, woman. Yeah, chances. Yeah, chances are eighty percent don't like me and yeah. they turn me down. So why would she? Maybe be it's different? the state of mind that you're in. Yeah, yeah, well, there's an ev evolutionary theory around this is that uh, that men, men are going to there. It's better for them to swing the bat as many times as possible, even though they're going to strike out a lot because then they'll always. There's always going to be that one that might actually connect. So it's better for us to assume hmm. that they like, because that's evolutionary theory. But anyway, it's, it's just funny and it's totally true. And I, you know, my, my wife and I got in a fight la last night over this because she were, you know, I'm coming out, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of the room. I just put my son to bed and she comes out of the shower and she's half naked. And I'm like, Hey, uh, yes. okay. And I go up, try to give her a hug and she hugs me real quick. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming like you're half naked. You're hugging me. Yeah. yeah. This, this, this means green light. We're going to have sex right now. Big buttons. <laughs> just this is going to happen right now. And then yeah. she's like, oh, no, no, hold on. I got to go do a, a couple things. And she walks away. Immediately, I feel rejected. Like, what just happened? <laughs> so Where I sit going? down. She senses the, the, the tone, the change in me. And this is a common thing with us, right? I assume. Maybe expect like something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And she's like, why why'd you, why'd you get all mad? I'm like, well, I feel rejected. So we have a big fight about it. Whatever. Oh, my but God. I'm like, honey, if you hug me. First of all, if you're just half naked, <laughs> bro, you gotta flip, you, you gotta me. flip the script, bro. Yeah, you gotta yeah. flip the script. That's yeah. what I do. That's why last night we had so Act funny. Like nothing. You had you had <laughs> that the we had a similar. Uh, it wasn't an argument, but it was like uh, Katrina. <laughs> I obviously uh, I'm feeling good. I'm back in shape, right? And I've talked about on the podcast before that. Katrina's like, I always know when you feel good because all of a sudden you're, you know, brushing your teeth naked. You're walking downstairs <laughs> naked. So this 100% is Just where I'm shirt on. Yeah, yeah. Right now, I, yeah, yeah, Winnie the Pooh. I'm Winnie <laughs> Pooh. I'm Winnie Pooh in the house. You know what I'm saying? All, all over the place, oh, right? Shirt. So 100% I'm that guy, <laughs> oh, right? I, and, I didn't that. need that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Just bottom butt cheek <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so uh, I do that, you know, and she walks and I walk by her. She's like folding laundry stuff with that and I'm walking through the house, you know, it's like six o'clock and I'm, you know, ass naked or whatever with that and she reaches and just grabs me and i was like hey hey what are you doing <laughs> she's like you're gonna walk hey, around naked being. like that what are you what are you doing <laughs> i get it yeah yeah but I then I, I do the opposite play hard again like no stop it don't touch me you know yeah yeah you gotta warm me up that's what i say to her. My, you, gotta, my, you gotta warm me up my wife was like mood. just because yeah. i hug you and kiss you or just because i say hi to you and she's like going down a list of all the things i'm like don't, those all don't mean that you want to have sex with me. Like, no, oh man, I, I, I do. I do think yeah, there's this weird. Slapper. I mean, okay, Justin, you you've been married for a long yeah. time, so you've probably recalled this. It does. At least I feel like this way in uh, my relationship with Katrina. We've been together for a long time too. Like, um, the, it ping pongs back and forth. Mm -hmm. In our at least in our relationship, we've been that. There's been times where one of us, and I I just feel like 
whoever wants it less, the other person naturally wants it more. I think yes. it just kind of happens. It's like, it doesn't matter who there's that. There's like seasons as I like to call yeah, it. Yeah. There's just, there, yeah. there's been times in our, in our relationship where she, she has a much higher sex drive at that time and then mm -hmm. I do. And then so I'm, and just me simply not wanting as much as her makes her want it even more. And yeah. then vice versa when yeah. the other, when the role is reversed, when I'm in that uh, high sex drive and she may not be, and I think in our relationship, more of it has to do more than sex, like as far as our, you know, female male has more to do with what's going on in our life. Like for me, uh, work stress, yeah. financial stuff, like that will, that'll kill my I libido. Totally yeah. Echo yeah. Yeah. That'll all, kill my libido. You know what I'm saying? Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, we have a free guide. It's the benefits of eating whole foods. This gives you a shopping list. What foods are best for proteins, fats, carbohydrates. There's recipe samples. It's all based on real, whole, natural foods and it's a free guide it's totally free you can get it if you go to wholefoodsguide.com or by clicking on the link in the description below anytime i'm like drifting off and like continuously thinking about something work wise creative wise like you know kid what like i'm just like not there she's just like hey remember me you yeah know? And it's like yeah. and and uh you know i mean that it, it typically happens for like a period of time where i'm just like kind of focused like i get really like fixated on accomplishing something yeah. i have like a mm -hmm. very specific project or goal i'm like i gotta do this and then and then that's usually when the roles flip but like yeah especially the very beginning of the relationship it's so funny because i'm like i always try to remind her i'm like you remember like how that was like and i was like <laughs> you know come on man i gotta go to work I have you to know it's like no yeah. <laughs> like, you were like that okay maybe it's me right now but you know like whatever yeah i think i wonder so how many people do you guys think and, I, and i'm curious if you guys really analyze this in your own relationship i definitely do and i'm very very aware of this happened this happened just like two nights ago where um uh it's eight o'clock or so at night max is already down for bed she's coming out of the shower and stuff like that and because i'm kind of sitting on the bed waiting for her i get my phone out and i'm in emails and i'm all of a sudden reading an email or whatever that and it's work related and now i'm like all of a sudden and it can literally take my like and and so yeah. unintentionally it's not like uh, like had i just left it alone and not done anything like that and just let myself sit and ponder in my own yeah. thoughts and maybe even watch her what she's doing i am so much in the mood and into whatever it is that we're doing or i'm already thinking about how the night's gonna go where if i go over and i make that switch mentally and it's like that it's a literally switch over the other way to work it auto automatically kills it and same thing i noticed with her too like if she grabs her phone in the bedroom I can tell a huge shift in the energy sexually around yeah. our relationship. It's wild. That's got to be normal. Mm -hmm. That's a normal thing. I, I know. I, I, so I I think so too. And so, but how many people evaluate that? Like, because I think it's healthy if you recognize that in yourself and in your spouse, that in, in a good partnership and a good relationship, well, especially if you're trying to work on well, that I area, think the big that you communicate that and you yeah. say, hey, let's commit that when we get into the room, we don't, no more phones. Like, do not touch the phone. Do not touch the laptop. Don't I touch. I think a bigger, a big mm -hmm. issue too is just, is time. Because when you don't have, especially when you don't have kids, little kids, just all this time for spontaneous um, connection to happen. There's all this spontaneous connection that can happen. But then when you have little kids and Stuff's going on. Uh, it, it doesn't happen as spontaneously. So, and people don't like this, but you have to schedule it. You have to plan. Hey, we're going to have time at this time together, just the two of us. It doesn't have to guarantee that we're going to get intimate, but we have to make that time. Otherwise, if you wait for the spontaneous, like, magic to happen it just ain't gonna happen especially with little kids well see i think i don't even think you have to go that far i think you just have to go as far as not allowing yourself to be distracted by other things mm -hmm. that's where the problem is if you just allow the space even with it when you have lots of kids so that the problem is when you have a lot of kids and you're really busy and you have a lot of work then you have this moment at seven to eight o'clock when your your wife and you finally do have potential loans and then you get distracted yeah. That's all bad. You, if you, you just create the space, different you know, story. You know, another issue for me is that if I know, like, if, if she's like, yeah, later tonight, whatever, that's all I can think about. And then I become, <laughs> and then I'm annoying because I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like hovering over her like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Are ready? Are you ready? See, I'm the opposite. And she's like, I'm can the, you stop I'm, breathing? See, I'm out? the opposite with that. I'm like, a, <laughs> I'm like a chick when it comes to that stuff. Like, I don't, I don't want to be like forecasted that we're having sex. I'd rather be, feel like it was spontaneous in the moment. If she tells me like, oh, you're going to get tonight, it doesn't make me go like really? that. No, not at all. I'm like, mm. I'm the opposite. Like, I, I feel it's again, and it's, it's, I think it's that feeling of, you know, they want it so bad that it makes you want it less. Not no 
knowing that the suspense of that, there's mm. something more sexy or sexual about that yeah. than the forecasting. Yeah. Of yeah, I stopped doing that because then like it, she'll go to sleep and then I'll be like, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> again, you know. And so it's just like I, I, you know, then it's been working out better to just like stay busy and like, okay, might happen, might not happen, yeah. you know. And then yeah, I know. The randomness will. I, I gotta, will, I gotta get better. Yeah, I don't, if, I don't you, know, if I, you talk about it, you have to know the same thing, right? If you bring it up, it's worse, right? It, if you tell, if you tell her, hey, I want it to or this that it's like oh you may as well not because then i get all handsy all day and, that's it you know yeah. and i'm just like a pain in her ass you like it's just it's too much you know and i'm like yeah i obsess over it so yeah i definitely have those tendencies yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. <laughs> like, like, i gotta calm down yeah, <laughs> yeah how did they do i don't know how they like i have like my i have family members right like older family members like my grandparents generation were they lived in a room they lived in a room with eight kids. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how did you get the other seven kids? You're all in one room. You don't even have a bathroom. You have an outhouse. Yeah. Is that what you guys did? Like, yeah. what'd you guys do? Did you just like run around the corner? They heard snoring. Yeah, yeah. how did they, you know? They the time are, it. You know? It's, <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah. How did they do yeah. it? They had so many kids. Yeah. I mean, I think you figure it out. You get creative. That's not true. <laughs> I know, that's true. And maybe there's something about the fact that you you both can't because of those situations that make you both want it more. You know, true. Because you're you're restricted because of your environment and your situation. Therefore, yeah. there's this equal pull of like, oh god, I don't know if we can. Or and so maybe both are thinking about it more, so it's more likely to happen. I don't know. Oh, Obviously, yeah, speculating. Crazy. Hey, speaking of family, you know what the number one uh, product that we promote that now I'm getting more and more more and more of my family members that are, are, are contacting me about I know what it is because I'm getting the same thing on mine it's Sheila Jeet yeah it's because of the, it's because it's of the, the ad yes the really? ads I've had several people that like, and these are me. cousins that I don't normally talk yes, to it, and this, then they'll run into me and be like dude I got the Sheila Jeet I saw your commercial that's how I always know that like Organifi is doing a really good job with their ads wow. is that when I get a call or a message from a family member that is not a normal one to call me mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying about a product or a thing and they're all Always like this. Hey, is this is this the real deal? Mm -hmm. Is this bullshit? Like I saw this. Like or, yes, exactly. Or, yeah, yeah. Is this yeah. bullshit? Or do you have extra of this? Like that's what I get. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh wow, they must be really pumping these ads because this is not a normal family member that would yeah. call me. Over but they now. like it. They're all telling me they like it. Uh -huh. They notice the energy from it. Yeah. And, uh, one yeah. of my cousins said his libido got you know boosted from it or whatever. But it's like been like four four family members. Now. It doesn't last around here. I do find it's interesting that uh, you know okay we we talked about this way back in the CBD days like the fitness space tends to do this, right? Where, and, and by the way, uh, CBD has incredible value too, but once something gains a little bit of attraction and then it's like, then everybody starts yeah. doing it. Like I, I see C. Legit stuff everywhere now. Yeah. I mean, I we've already been sent. I've got a bar of soap. It's not a new kind of bar of soap that it's got yeah, it in it. I've far. got like that, all, it is like CBD. Remember, CBD had everything. Yes, so like CBD that's what, soap, CBD. Perfume. Yes, there's uh, Shilajit everything yeah. now. Yeah. I've, there, I'm seeing all these products. that Shilajit are just, is it's funny too because it's not a new. It's not a new. Uh, right, it's compound. been around forever. It's right? been, been used for a long time in Ayurvedic medicine. So why so popular right now? I. You know, I don't know. A recent study, maybe? I, you know, it's a lot of studies. The studies on Shilajit have been around for a long time. So it's not like a new study mm. came out. There's a lot of studies on it that show its benefits. So it's benefit for hormone balance, uh, energy, um, fertility. Um, there's some athletic performance enhancing benefits. But those studies have been around for, for a bit. Maybe it was just the delivery of it. You know, like changing it into Honestly, a gummy is is kind of like. Are you seeing all I, the gummy stuff? Yeah, dude, yeah. the gummy thing is like yeah. full throttle taking down. over. Yes, I mean when it first started, and you started to see this in vitamins for kids and whatnot, and then you know the 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 way that they would like continuously take it. You're like, oh well, I know they're going to take it, and so mm -hmm. it's like, why would adults be any different? Well, you know, they found what they were finding is that that adults were buying kids gummy, uh, and they were taking their. Yeah. That's what they found. Yeah, it was so one now of those it's guys. so you know now it's all over the place. I yeah, know. I mean I've seen it for every product. Every product now is is they're changing, which I think it's so weird they took this long. Yeah, I think it's weird that it, it's it's taken this long for that. It's one of those duh. It's yeah, only, it's, a very, it's only the real zealots that are like, oh, well, I'm gonna get like you know some sugar and and like you know I don't need that extra bit like with, but like really is it that much? Well, I guess I guess there's that. I mean, it's it's probably a little more expensive, right? To create it in gummy form, I imagine. It is, but it's also- So the product's a little bit more? You know what the biggest challenge yeah, in the supplement be. industry is? The biggest, same, is, this is, by the way, the same challenge in the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, it's just- Is it, it. it, it yeah. people, people Yeah, there's don't studies take it. that show we are more likely to give our dog 
it's medication than ourselves. Yeah, people yeah. forget and they don't take it. No, oh, I bought that bottle, but I stopped taking it. I've heard antibiotics like it, yes. you know, people don't go through the full cycle. You're yep. supposed to finish it all the way through. Yep. Yeah, hundred yep. so, percent. Speaking of our industry, by the way, you know what's starting to annoy me really bad, and it's it's it anno it's it, it annoyed me for a while, but now it, it's getting a fever pitch, and uh, they target you know our favorite people in the fitness industry, and it's these online fitness coaching coaching companies that coach <laughs> fitness coaches that teach them how to make more money that teach them how to do this how to do that whatever yeah and there's a lot of charlatans it's, that are it's out now. riddled terrible and some of the approach some of the, oh it's making me so mad and some of the, well, appro the that's the, why the we model. got in this space i mean let's be honest Whoa. it's very um i mean it's it's been very mlms i actually don't think it's anything new i think it's um uh, it's new to the medium and so, but it's very MLM, you know, mm -hmm. like I remember, so I remember talking to uh, Lewis Howes back in the days and this was actually how he got his big start and actually his bit of traction was back when LinkedIn. LinkedIn yeah. So what year was LinkedIn popular? But when it, when it was created, this was, was at least 10 years ago. Oh God, way more than that. Way more than 10 years ago. That company's that probably closer this? to 20, 20 years. Years. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. 20 years old. Find out Doug. What is that? Yeah, 2002. Yeah. So oh, over, 20, over 20 years, yeah. over 20 years. So when LinkedIn was brand new, he was part of these these people that would c get together these groups and they would create like these mastermind mastermind s type of groups and so this formula has been around forever and really what a lot of them do is they i mean they there's some there's some valuable information in some of these these groups and they they share books that you're reading and they, but it nothing is groundbreaking nothing isn't you couldn't google online and then really what ends up happening is they all teach each other how to do the same model it's like the business coaching is really to teach you how to sell business coaching to everybody yes. else. Mm -hmm. and then, so and that's the part that I think is, is that, that is blah, it's for me. Frust it's frustrating. And a lot of these uh, people who are teaching, you know, they're doing these courses and they're teaching other trainers have never really trained people. They've never really been successful trainers themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were trainer for a year or maybe six months. And now all of a sudden they're teaching. Like if you haven't trained people for 10 years and done a damn good job doing it, <laughs> you have no business teaching coaches how to be better coaches. You yeah. just don't. And if you're teaching, and then one of the models that we started becoming privy to, one of the reasons why we, we, we had to sever ties with certain people is they were teaching coaches how to build these businesses with other coaches under them generating lots of revenue with such slim margins that they were they were yeah. they were generating half a million dollars in, just in revenue and big. making eighty thousand or sixty thousand dollars a year when yeah. they could have done it by themselves. Just yeah. have all this headache it to build all this whatever. It's enticing, you know, to to make you know that kind of revenue, but the overall profit they're bringing home was slim. And and now what you've done is is created a crazy amount of work and management, you know, with these other people that you've hired. And it's on. all well, based the, off the, these like thirty day challenges. The, brilli the brilliance behind it and why it works and it's so successful is because somebody who does it. So you let's say you pay five thousand dollars for said coaching course or whatever. And I teach you this way to create, drum up some attention and create some sort of a challenge that drives X amount of dollars revenue. All they need to do is show that person how to make $6,000, which is $1,000 more than what they paid for this course. And people, regardless if they stick with it, regardless if they build a business off of it, they go, well, I made more they justified than, it. yeah, they justify it. And then therefore it doesn't get as bad of a rap as it probably should in reality. And the unfortunate part is a lot of these young trainers that fall into this, they fall into this as the model in order to be very successful versus really putting a lot of energy and focus on chasing mastery and being good, being good, a good at trainer, your, being good at your craft yes. and, mm -hmm. and, and that, and that's not sexy to sell. I mean, that's probably one of the Achilles heels to our trainer coaching program is that it's centered around being a good coach, which is not something I can show you in 30 days. No. It's not something that you're even going to learn in probably six months. It's a practice and it's something that you work at your craft and you improve in over years. And then hopefully after thousands of hours, you've now become a master at your craft and you've built a and, really solid base. And not to mention yeah. if you're, if you're a coach and you actually do have a passion for fitness and you're new and you end up following uh, some of their advice. And so what do you do? You do your 30 day challenges and every so often you got to drum up new business with another 30 day challenge. 
you start to lose your passion for fitness. Mm -hmm. You start to be like, God, I don't want to keep running these challenges. I don't want to keep yeah. doing this just so I could like, this doesn't feel you're good. You're a momentum hustler. It's uh, yes. You're a momentum hustler. You're, you're slinging a bunch of promises and eventually you don't feel good. You don't feel good about it. Yeah. And so you end up stopping. So I've, I've met coaches like this. Like, I don't want to do another 30 day challenge to try to get, you know, more, more business. This is just not, it's a, yeah, it's it, it doesn't feel it's right. It's a very enticing model because we live in this instant gratification time. Right. And, and it's a quick way to instantly see a difference in revenue. It's like, I don't know, very much so our approach to helping trainers is the same approach that we have with helping clients. That's it. It's the same reason why we had challenges with selling maps programs around the game because it wasn't this sexy 30 day transform your body and we were showing pictures like that. It was, hey, teaching people the philosophy yeah. around the nutrition and exercise and fundamentals and that, hey, this is going to take a long time, but yeah. it's going to be worth it. If you take the time to learn this, to do the things the right way, that this could potentially change your life forever and it's going to be worth it. I feel the same. We have the same type of a conversation and approach with all of our trainers is that, no, we don't have some, you know, clickbaity trick hack for you to all of a sudden 10x your revenue. Uh, but what we do have is a, a lot of incredible principles and things that we've learned over decades of doing this, that we can help you get to a shortcut there. So instead of you having to hit a brick wall, we've hit those 10 brick walls for you and then can share with you like, hey, this is a better approach or this is how you handle this type of a challenge. But at the end of the day, you still have to go put in the work. You still got to put the hours in. You still got to chase mastery. And that's what's going to make you a really good coach, not for a year or for a quarter, but- no, for, you're going to build a career. Yeah, forever. And so- yeah, I just we have a lot of that in you know, Instagram and Facebook. It's really popular to to sell online coaching to coaches and you know teaching them basically bullshit. And uh, I don't know if it it will ever go away. And I think it's been around forever. Just we have a different medium now with Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. And it's a very popular model. It's also, again, why uh, I know we waited a really long time before we even offered anything for trainers. I think it was first uh, we had to build that credibility with the free content and information that we gave to people and help trainers. Uh, and, and I think that was what we waited for. Just like we waited to put out MAPS programs for the general population, we waited a really long time to create something for personal trainers, and it was waiting until we had built that credibility. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right. Back to the show. Yes, it's like it's 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 just like this. Like in the when we were managing gyms, right? You had those trainers that had so much turnover with their clients. Like they could make sales, but they would lose clients as fast as they'd sign them. And every month, every other month, they had to keep getting new business. You just knew, you just knew they weren't going to last. That's yeah. not a career. You're not really helping anybody. You're going to get tired of that. You're going to get burnt out. And you're losing. I mean, I, I have a guarantee for you if you're a trainer, a coach, or aspiring one, and you're listening to this. Um, I challenge you whether you've hired someone like this or you're considering hiring someone like this. Uh, don't or just show up and attend our free webinars every other free webinars that we're going to provide. And I guarantee you the information, the content that we give for free in these webinars will be as valuable or more valuable than the thousands of dollars that you're spending on these virtual coaches that are helping us. And that's my promise and commitment. And I, and I will continue, we will continue to provide that kind of value until we do. So even if it's not the very first time, I guarantee you show up to enough of those by the end of say 10 of those things that you've showed up to, you will have learned more, you have become a better coach and it'll be absolutely for free. Totally. And that to me is like, I mean, that's there the way to do this is to show people, People by providing your and it's not hard for us to do that because of how long we've been doing this for it's like there's an endless amount of content and value to provide and give to these coaches and trainers what it is not is a quick hack or system to ten thousand dollars in revenue i'm not going to teach you that yeah you know that's actually there uh i remember um who i don't remember who we were talking to uh but i remember doug was there and they're cracking down on a lot of the claims out uh -huh, there yeah. of uh -huh. people that are using that type of marketing strategy to claim you can make a certain amount uh -huh. of money by doing this because they know how powerful and enticing that is. And then it's like, how can you guarantee something like that? And so I know they're cracking down big time on people that are running in ads like that. So it's getting more challenging 
for the charlatans. It's just, and, and at the end of the day, the cream will always rise to the and top. And it's just lack of integrity. <clears throat> like I think if you've been training people for a decade, you obviously have proven you really care about people. You really care about what you're doing, and you're less likely to get into the ripoff game with other trainers and coaches because you respect them. Like when I talk to a trainer or a coach, and I can see and I can hear that they genuinely want to do this and they really love this, like I respect them. I don't want to rip them off. I don't want to send them the wrong direction. I respect them because I did it. I did it for two decades, you know? Yeah. And so I think that's the- We need more of them too. Yes. That's the thing. And we want good quality ones out there. We don't want a bunch of hustlers just ripping garbage. people off. Yeah. yeah, a bunch of garbage. So speaking of business and exciting and cool things that we're doing, something else that we're doing that we've never done before that I'm super pumped about. So- Every year, uh, Black Friday is crazy. It's always the biggest month of the year for the business. Like, it's always the biggest, largest sale and the coolest things that we do at this time of the year. So it's always a great, a great month for us, regardless. And this year, I mean, we're coming up on ten years we've been in business. We're thinking of like, what are some cool things that we can do for our community uh, outside of the typical Black Friday? And we decided that we were not one, but two different people will have the opportunity to win a a, a, a free stay for five days, right, Doug? Correct. At the Park City house, right? And then we'll also give vouchers for traveling, correct? Yeah, $1,000 each. So $1,000 uh, for each of the winners. For flight. So basically cover flights and your stay at Park City. And the way that you'll get chosen by this is everything that we do, everything from mods to bundles to single programs, will give you entries. So during the Black Friday sale, when this goes live and we launch, that well, every this is time early access actually we're going to do early access to black friday as of the as, oh, of as this starting episode. now oh, yeah. sorry. Early so, early access. so yeah. after the, okay so this episode so it's 60 percent off everything uh that's the black friday early access sale and then if you get a bundle you get 10 entries you buy a program you get five entries and everything else mods guides etc one entry and that enters you to win the five-day stay at the moment yeah and, and we'll end up we'll else. choose two big winners at the end of the whole black friday run that we do and uh, by the way, that house is optimized for for yeah. health and fitness. So we have a gym in the garage, yeah, you sauna, got all the toys, cold dip. You got like sleep systems on the beds, red light therapy. You got a theater in there. Oh yeah, and and this will be something that uh, you'll be. So by the way, too, it's not like you'll have to fit it in our week. You'll have an opportunity to book it any time within the next year. Uh, if you want to take your family there for Christmas or a holiday or a good time in there or the ski season, something like that, it'll be uh, an opportunity. You're talking about something that's like a, close to a thousand dollars a night to to stay at this place. That that's all covered plus the expenses for you to get flights and stuff over yeah. there. So really, really cool. Hopefully, everybody gets as excited as I think we are to be able to give this back you, and do this. You have to use a code right for the for the entries and the discount is it Black yeah, Friday? Yeah, so it is. Black Friday is the code, 60% off at mapsfitnessproducts.com. And then you do all this stuff. Yeah, and if you want to check out the house, just go to mindpumprentals.com. Yeah. You can check yeah. It have, have you guys been there since I got the Traeger Grill set up there? No. Not yes. yet, no. Oh, yeah. yeah. We got, he, so that, that house has Kendrick. the best Traeger Grill that yeah. we have. We yeah. have the, the big monster. I forget what it's mm. called, but it's like the big, you it's know. beast couple thousand dollars for that mm. thing and i i love and this is obviously not a commercial for traeger we're not partnered with them or anything like that but i love smoking uh my meat on traeger i mean that's like my go-to well, if you and doug are like the meat masters with that oh man you know what i use the other day speaking of that so weird, is so, yeah i did uh i did some grass-fed i did some grass-fed beef from Master butcher box i i slow cooked it uh on the smoker and then I, I I used the iron skillet and I pan seared it in Palo Valley's uh, beef tallow. Oh, so I used the beef tallow. So basically, I did a a slow. What did you just put like a tablespoon in there? Yep. So I did it first. I I slow cooked it. I used to use like some basic Montreal seasoning. That's my favorite seasoning that I use on the on the steak. I slow cooked it. I brought it up to 135 degrees in the center. Is that center. called a reverse sear when you sear it after you yeah. cook it? Yeah. Okay. And then after it's done, done being smoked, I let it sit for like a couple minutes. Cowgirl. I heat up that iron skillet to as hot as it possibly can get. I drop a tablespoon of that the beef tallow from Paleo Valley, and then I <clears throat> let that steak sear for one minute on each side. And it's like you know, it's you know, about as good and juicy and tasty you can make a grass-fed steak you, taste you know what else you could do with that beef tallow 
you could you could like like low fry potatoes, like sliced mm. potatoes. Uh, and fry. Yeah, I've done that. Oh, oh my god! By the way, about these are nice crisp oh. with, the, with the beef. Huh? With yeah. beef towel, like bro. That. This is what McDonald's used to make the fries in. Exactly. McDonald's used to make their French fries. Yeah, they used to they fry them it. in beef tallow. Oh. And then some vegan. I don't know why I didn't think about some that. vegans sued them yeah. and said because oh it's not vegan the fries aren't so vegan. Now it's all so now it's all crap. like like this chemical concoction uh, to fry the. But they used to be straight what up. What a good. You know, it's crazy. I wish I would have thought that because i actually made we make uh one of my favorite dishes yeah, to go good. with steak katrina makes these the little red potatoes yeah we cut them in half and then she does like this little light layer of cheese justin would love this yeah. and it'll kind of crisp the cheese in it talk, talk we, dirty to me. we normally do that but i now that i'm already using that that grease for the or that towel yes, for dude. the steak you just th you know, th the, thin slice the, some potatoes and throw them in there yeah, like yeah. a shallow fry yeah. oh bro yeah especially with those small red potatoes that'd probably work perfect oh like, drop so them in good. there for a couple minutes and they're good oh it's so um, good gonna, it's the best gonna, thing gonna, ever i'll do that I was, oh so uh change of topic here i just read something the other day i was showing justin it's really cool so you know how i've talked about um in the past about how hunter gatherers hunt you know tend to hunt their prey or how humans probably caught animals and this is all in the in the context of uh, talking yeah. about yeah, yeah yeah modern hunter gatherers and how they run all the time but they don't burn more calories than us because the adaptation etc cetera, etc cetera. anyway humans we do very few things very well physically and one of them is we can outrun for distance pretty much any animal like this is how we became apex predators. We could throw with accuracy, so we'd throw a spear, and then we'd run after an animal until it got tired, and then we would totally yeah, kill it. We'd out endure them. So they, there was this graphic, this cool little video graphic that I found online that showed what would happen if a cheetah, a bear, a camel, a horse, a lion, and a wolf raced in an ultra marathon. And it shows which ones take off first, and then as oh, the miles really? continue, Cheetah, who starts to like, catch up and who starts to? Oh, I want to see this. Bro, it's out. it's so cool. So it's so so. Wait, okay. wait, pull them up because I want to try and guess. This oh, will be interesting to see who got first. Oh, Dude. I don't know. We got to find it. It's in the oh. form. I got to find it for you. Though. Oh man, I want to see because I want to guess. Okay, so we have a, a wolf, a cheetah, a uh, yes, a horse. Oh. So hold on. There's a, a cheetah, a bear, a camel, a horse, a lion, a wolf, and then a human. Well, okay, first and second is camel and horse. That's first and second place. No, yeah, for the marathon for the for the ultra. Yeah, yes. human, human. Oh, humans in there. Human. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know the, so yeah. human. But then camel, it goes camel. Yeah. Then it goes horse. You're right. Yeah, yeah camel. Camel, sure. camel barely beats out the the horse. Yeah, but yeah. those but yeah, those human, gotta be top three. Did you guys know there was? I think I brought this up years ago. There there used to be a Cheetah race done like quick. Yeah, yeah. Cheetah was out and then just tired. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a race where a a human would race a horse every year. I forgot where it was done. I want to say New York. And uh, I think more often than not, the human win would win, but sometimes a horse would. But it was like this big race, and it was human versus horse, and wow. people would go and bet or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a cool little thing to do because I bet a lot of people wouldn't guess that. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. I, I know that we've talked about that. It's so about the human in, in there. And then I know that camels, that's what one of the things they're known for is how far they can go without even drinking water. Yes. Yeah. They can go a long, long way. Yeah. Oh, there it is. So you can see the animals all taken off. Okay. So what comes after all that? That's what I want to know. Because I, I this is not, so this is not the very beginning because the cheetah went, but there's the horse kind of beating everybody, but it takes forever for the human to catch up. What's that, on What's the that bottom? bottom one? Yeah. That's a wolf. There's an ostrich. Oh, ostrich. That's oh, yeah. I forgot ostrich. about the ostrich, darn it. Oh, an ostrich. Ostrich does really yeah, well, do. dude. Yeah. Ostrich really? does really well. It two legged. Long. You run on two legs, it makes you really good at distance. That's one of the reasons why humans do so well. Yeah, I want to. I really want to see what what. Uh, so, yeah, Doug, can you can you tell us what uh, the, who finishes? Right, <laughs> there's the camel yeah. starting to catch up. You ever to seen them. somebody ride on an ostrich? It's a trip. Can you? Oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's a like, human right like, now. Literally sit on them and they coming up here. Yeah. Ride them and then yeah, you speed up and there's the human. So yeah, number one, human. Number two, camel. Number yep. three, horse. Number okay. four, ostrich. Uh, ostrich. Ostrich is four. Yeah. Well, I would not have guessed that. <laughs> That's great. And then what's five? Do the other ones just die off? Then you yeah, finish? they're dead, bro. They went home. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards. Heart exploded. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, how cool is that, though, right? How cool is it that? Because I, when I was a kid, I thought humans were just physically just, we're just, we can't do anything. Good, yeah. Right? We're just, you know, we're, we're smart. Yeah. But uh, that's that. And then throwing with accuracy. Like, no animal... Well, that's what I always well thought. We Humans, we had the ability to throw. Yeah. Which, you know, I guess, I mean, some primates can do that. But, right? not, but accurate. not like accurate. Yeah. Not like us. Yeah. But how scary is that? Because as I'm watching that, I'm thinking like, imagine being the but, animal that is being 
run down by a human. You're Dude, like, have you ever seen? You're that? just looking back, yeah. and they're still coming. You're like, why aren't they stopping? It's like Jason yeah. in, in Friday the yeah. Thirteenth. You know, yeah, yeah. just keeps coming after you. Have it's you terrifying. Ever, have you ever seen that video of I think it was a orangutan that uh, like spear fished? No, it, it was watching um, fishermen and like just picked up the 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 trait of them um, throwing these spears. And so he like made its own stick and like threw it in what? and was like, yeah, like teaching itself how to fish like that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's crazy. There was one game show. Uh, I believe it was a Japanese, probably a Japanese game show. They, always have <laughs> they have the game best. Shows. I know. They <laughs> <have> the best. <laughs> some of my favorite, dude. Some of the game shows though, I'm like, who wild. This? Yeah. What are we doing here? Yeah. Why are they? <laughs> but there was one where there was a, um, it was an orangutan. Was it an orangutan? No. Which one's the orange, uh, Coated one. Yes, yeah, orangutan. Is that orangutan? Uh -huh. Okay, it was an orangutan with a um, with a rope, and on the other end were like strong athletes, and they were doing tug of war. <laughs> and the and the orangutan is literally probably playing with them, bro. Man. He's holding on to the rope, and it, he looks bored. Yeah. And they're just ah, and he's just like doing this. And then finally, the the you know the owners give him the like pull, make sure you pull, and he's kind of confused, like oh okay, and he just pulls the people off the off the you know. Uh, How many people was the, he wrestling? There was like two people, three, just so strong, wow, and he's like dude. only. He was only 170 pounds. They're insane. Chimps are the same, you know, and there's some, I forget what they're called, but there's like this um, uh, certain place. I don't know if it's in Africa or, or South America. It must be in Africa somewhere um, where they're actually like so big uh, that it, they're almost as like as tall as a human mm. and walking around like on, on two legs and uh, just jacked. I was having this talk with my four-year-old. He gets real curious about stuff. Um, and he was making a joke about butts or what he like thinks. It's, he thinks butts are hilarious. Yeah. And I said, butts you know, and farts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, uh, humans have the biggest butts out of all the, the primates. Yeah. And he's like, what? And yeah. so I'm explaining Gorillas to him. Like, have no butt. None. And I'm like, the reason why we have such big butts is because we stand upright. Yeah. And, and small pee pee. And, and, <laughs> we have the biggest. Yeah. Humans have the biggest Winning. proportion. Yeah. Uh, that's true. That's true. I just want to throw that in. That's there. a fact, everybody. It is. It's factual. It Check it, it out. Up. I didn't look it up myself. I used to look it up. Yeah. But anyway, I was explaining them uh, the size of our glutes and how that keeps us upright and how we have big knee joints as a result. And this is, he's like super curious about uh, this stuff. So, and you know, it's so cool to see them as they work through their phases. I, we just moved into a new phase, Max and I, and I've been waiting for this. Uh, you know, I, you know, how the kids are with like their books that you read, like the, the attention span is very short. So most, yeah. most under five-year-old books are pretty short and pictures and like, you know, funny, sh sh small sentences. And I've been wa waiting. So my sister, um, when, when Max was born and I believe you guys, I don't know if it was you guys who recommended it first or, but you know, the Tuttle twins, yeah, right? of course. So I've been waiting for when oh, I can great. introduce those books, right? Like, and you talk about markets and yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and they're you know they're a little obviously deeper, and so it's probably more appropriate for like I don't know middle school or you know maybe seven eight. Yeah, yeah, probably seven eight. But uh, last night we sat through he sat through an entire Tuttle Twins book uh, about markets, and I was just like, holy shit! And Katrina <laughs> Katrina was watching on the camera, and we came in, and she's just like. I can't believe he sat through that entire. I said, you know, I told him, let's just, I told him I was only going to read because what I did was, it, he, like, um, you know, the, the way we decide how many books Max is going to read is the way he moves through the process of getting ready for bed. So typically he gets about three books to read before bed. If he's lollygagging on his bath time and other things like that, it reduces the amount of books and we allow him to negotiate that. So it's like sometimes he's in the bath and he's like, Oh, I want to, I still want to stay longer and play. Okay. You can stay longer and play in the bath, but then you're only going to get two books. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to get out sooner or later. And so we kind of let him de decide that a lot of time. And so it was a night where he was down to one book, right? Cause he stayed in the bath extra long playing. So, okay, there's only one book tonight. And so Katrina, had, I read to him, Katrina had the book picked out and then I read to him and I had the book Tuttle twins on there and I'm like, oh, let me see it. And so I go, Hey, you, I'll let you read another book if you let me pick it. And he's like, okay, you know, of course, right? Because mm -hmm. he gets to stay up a little bit longer. And then I said, well, just start with five pages. Daddy wants you to, I want to read Tuttle Twins to you. And so I started reading it and he just- He's into it? Bro, he just snuggled up to me, didn't distract, was just listening. And like, I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I ended up reading the whole thing. And, and Katrina's like, oh my God, he sat through that. I said, I don't know. I said, maybe because he was lucky and he knew he was getting to read an extra book. <laughs> I said, but I'll take it as hey. a win. I'm like, I've been wanting to introduce those books to him for a long Plant time. seeds. That's yeah. So awesome. I tried to read it to him a long time. Time ago, way before he was early, early enough, and it was too early. Although 
he remembered like the octopus in that from so the the first book i read to him was uh, dr jekyll mr Hi oh. uh, jekyll island right basically and the creation oh. of the federal yes, reserve yeah, the <laughs> bro, these Rose books are amazing jekyll yes bro i love these books these books you are, never seen these books i haven't oh, oh they're bro great, dude. they're awesome i mean i heard of them but you teach I, your yeah, kid didn't... the creation of the federal reserve yes i that's literally amazing. read him about that's the, like an evil octopus yes <laughs> i taught him about the federal reserve last night Classic. and like it was great that but he re he remembered he's like dad is this the octopus that takes the money and i'm like yes <laughs> yes it is i let me tell you about Their it right tentacles going yes everything. Dude. it's ever growing yes <laughs> yeah. so i'm like okay i obviously it's pretty heavy and deep and he's probably not fully grasping it but if it's already starting to get the wheels turning a little bit i'm like oh this will be great dude. when he uh when it puts comes all together so, just my, so the other night where we we're, we're, jessica was cleaning up the kitchen and I'm, i wanted to take a shower and she's like you know what just Bring him in the bathroom with the, while you take a shower. I'm like, what are they going to do? She's like, entertain him. I don't know. She's like, put your butt up against the glass door or whatever. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. And my kids are like laughing. My son goes, yeah, do that. You need to do that. Mom, <laughs> he's like, mom does that. Mom does that. I'm like, you do that? She's like, yeah, who cares? They laugh. I'm like, honey, there's a big difference between mom and dad. I'm yeah. like, I'm not going to traumatize my kid. <laughs> 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 yeah. He's going to remember that for the rest of his life, oh, dude. God. And they thought it was hilarious, but I'm like, you want me to traumatize my son? My <laughs> <laughs> dad's oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> You know, no, I'm not going to entertain him in the shower, oh. watch some TV or something like oh, that. You know? God. We were dying. Twerking dude. daddy. We were, we were laughing so hard. <laughs> who, who brought the stat for uh, age or for orgasms for women? Oh, is yeah. That, is that the you? Best, yeah, there's a, there was a, um, a study on what age Age, what, okay, so let me ask you guys this. What age range do you think women report the best sex and orgasms? So I think I know the answer, so I also don't want to give you the answer because I feel like I already know this. So I, think like, it's in the 40, I think it's in the 40s. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's mid to, mid to late 30s or 40s. It's definitely not later than 45. It's definitely not earlier than 35. So between 35 yeah, and 40. Yeah, 20s, not 30. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say it's Yeah, later. that's it. That's yeah. 100%. Is yeah. that what it is? Yeah, it's also when women start to have the best uh, the, the best body acceptance. And, mm. So, okay. That, that, Wait, which, by the way, this is interesting. That's got to be a big factor. This is interesting for, for, for women to listen to, especially if you're a young, young woman that women in the older age groups have better body satisfaction and acceptance than when they were younger, when presumably they had better objective bodies. Right. right. And yet they're, they're, they're happier with themselves yeah. later on in life. So what does that tell you? How much of this is so yeah. in our heads and oh, you know, yeah. how we hurt ourselves? So is that, our, so is that the prevailing theory on why the orgasms are better? Yes, they're it more is. comfortable. The more comfortable with themselves, uh, they know what they like, what they want. They're not so self-conscious. And, uh, now, do you believe this is also? Uh, I, I feel like this runs parallel to men too. Do you think that's that different for men? Men's sexual performance, I think, peaks earlier. Um, uh, so, and, wait, 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 performance and enjoyment are different things, though. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, maybe twenty-year-old you goes marathon yeah. for eight hours. Cogs that are turning. I don't yeah. know. That's a good yeah. question. Uh, you I know, mean, I think I'm having the best sex of my life at my age at 40, yeah. 43. So, yeah. I mean, would you not think that? Or yeah, you think probably. Yeah, I so would I, say I would so. think that it would run parallel the same, and and I would also make the argument that it's for similar reasons. I know that my security with the way I feel about who I am myself is different well, than the, it was the, when I was twenty something. At yeah, now. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> There's also ch you know, the chasing mastery thing. Yeah, you, know yeah, yeah, yeah. you put ten thousand hours ah, in. I'll do better next time. Yeah. <laughs> ten thousand reps yeah, later, yeah. I'm so again. much better. No, and there's also like there's also like the data on this goes counter to what a lot of people are led to believe. Like for example, the best the, the best sex people have. Uh, are committed couples. Mm -hmm. People who've been together for years and years and years, like 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years or more, report the most satisfying sex lives, which runs counter to what the media would have you believe. The media would have you believe that the most satisfying sex comes from one night stands and being promiscuous and whatever. It's like, no, no, it's people who've been together with each other for a long time yeah, have yeah, the most yeah. satisfying sex. Well, I think that's, yeah, that's, the, you can actually like be more vulnerable. Like I feel like there's a guard there because it's like, you're still trying to kind of, uh, prove something to your partner or whatever. Like if it's, if it's new and you haven't been with them, a there's lot. lots of factors. I yeah. think that there's the, you know, how comfortable you are. There's also when you're in a relationship for a long time, you yeah. learn what that well, person exactly. likes you and both wants. Are yeah. together. You know, yeah. along those lines, this it, I've heard people now, you're starting to hear this argument again. Cause for a long time this fell out of favor, but I think, I don't know, this is weird. You know, how culture is it, it, the pendulum swings back and forth. People are now arguing that cause the argument against waiting 
to have sex for marriage was always like, well, you need to know what you like and you need to make sure that you guys are, you guys are match up sexually. I'm hearing people now make the argument that no, that actually is not the case. And when people wait till marriage, they develop, they, they, they grow together with it and it mm -hmm. actually reports more satisfying yeah. sex lives. It's very interesting. And I could see how that I might be that. true, how that yeah. might actually be true where you're experiencing this for the first time with your partner together and growing along. I mean, do you other. think uh, I do get I do get comments that um, that I, I didn't anticipate, right? Uh, obviously, I didn't I didn't think about um, what this these types of things would happen when fatherhood came in and parenting and a family and stuff like that. But I do get a lot more often in private than I get publicly on my page. But even publicly, I just posted a picture of Katrina, me, and Max at Disney World with that. And uh, I get more and more people now, you know, saying things like, oh, goals, or I can't wait to be a father, or, yeah. I mean, watching you guys or hearing you guys talk about fatherhood excites me, or I've heard people say things like, I didn't think I wanted kids, and now I do want kids. Isn't after that hearing. weird how, how the culture t lies? It's such the opposite of the real, like, and the, and the data supports all that. So yeah. I, the reason why I brought that up is I'm asking that, do you think it's shifting, or is this just me and my little bubble and bias because? it's my experience of if what you I'm look hearing. at the data on people's perceptions especially young men it's shifting yeah yes young men are embracing uh tradition uh religion uh more than they have in previous decades and views around sex are starting to switch they're starting to to move from it's it's more freeing to be promiscuous to it's probably better to wait and to be with just one person um all of that is starting to shift and you're starting to see it in surveys yeah. So I, I don't think well, you're imagining it. Yeah, I was actually talking about this a bit with Courtney and, you know, like my <laughs> Ethan and my, you know, he's in that sort of age range now where it's like all, it's all kind of come into fruition in terms of like hormones and yeah. puberty and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, within that class of kids, like what they've been through in terms of uh, the disconnect and, and the separation and like there's it, like... I hate to tell this on the pod, but he had his first kiss, like, you know, yeah. and so it was like a big deal and it was like so innocent and like great. But uh, it, it's one of those things where it's like not a lot of his friends have had that experience yet. And you know, not a lot of his friends are like, like hooking up, like, you know, with, with a, a girlfriend or like, it's like, there's like this weird kind of disconnect. It's like uh, you, you sort of talk to them um, on social media and then you kind of get that opening and then you, but it's starting to kind of come back. I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, there there's efforts in terms of hanging out uh, and, you know, prioritizing a bit more of like seeking, um, you know, a partner. But it, it seemed there for a while. Like that was like, psh, yeah, everybody's like, nah. Well, there's a difference between like, I'm not interested because I'm distracted or because I'm scared. And well, he's a freshman, right? Yeah. I mean, that was really when like that's, I, that's about the right. I, yeah, I had I had girlfriends before, yeah, and I had my I had my first like like innocent kiss uh, before that. But when I I I distinctly remember the difference between my high school girlfriend and my girlfriend in eighth and seventh grade. Oh yeah. When high school came around, was the first time it was like you're making out. Well, not only that, but also like it was more about her and I than it was ever before. Like, it was before it was like saying I have a girlfriend, but I really hanging out with my friends all yeah, the time. Like I don't want to yeah. hang out. With, like I, I, I had a girlfriend to say I had a girlfriend, yeah. uh, but I still That's wanted to, do, I, I still wanted to spend yeah. all my time with my yeah. buddies and never care. It wasn't until freshman year in high school that my girlfriend, I actually wanted to spend time with. Yeah. I actually made out with that. Mm -hmm. That's that all happened right for me. That's when that happened really like all the stuff before even the kissing and the hanging out and the girls stuff before was not, it was different then. It was then. It was freshman year. So that seems about about. Yeah, right. I guess it is a bit on par. Were you yeah. different? Were you banging like in fourth grade or something? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, it, yeah, my, <laughs> my first kiss. I, think, uh, <laughs> was, I, I mean, it's like fourth grade. And yeah, then it was wow. Sixth grade was like tongue. Yeah. Wow. wow. You yeah. had wow. You yeah, were was, promiscuous. Yeah. A little slut. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, but I got totally cock blocked yeah. by before, my teachers. Uh, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she called her pa her, her parents and uh, oh my ended God. it for us. And I was oh, like, okay, man. Cool. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I no, I mean, bad. I wasn't that. When, when were you? Were you uh, like him? Were you slutty or were I was, you, did I, you wait? I, I mean, I was yeah, I was early, you know. I was definitely early. You were too, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was interested in girls, dude. Like, yeah, very from, early. From the jump. I See, I mean, my first girls. girlfriend was fourth grade and we held hands. And my first like kiss was fifth grade, but it was like a peck yeah. and a dare. Yeah. And then sixth grade, yes. it was like my friends pressuring me. You got to go kiss her. It was like. 
like that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And then high school came, and it was like I was genuinely interested in her. We were looking for places where we could go kiss and make out. Like that yeah. was like there was a huge shift for me. Hit yeah. freshman year, it was a yeah, major. You're right, I um, think that's but I, a major I, I, But I, I do, I am um, encouraged seeing the data and seeing how it's getting communicated a little bit differently, like a little bit differently. Like for so long, the message was promiscuity and that's what's that's what it's all about and it's great it's just about the pleasure it's just about the sex and objectifying each other and objectifying yourself you're starting to see that message shift a little bit which i'm i'm happy about because it's brought a lot of problems it really has it's brought a lot of problems especially with the with the ease of access to pornography that's caused so many issues. i wonder if uh, because of like social media and stuff like that we will see an acceleration of the movement because when you think about it the 60s really were the first rebellious movement to the traditional movement, yep. right? So before the 60s, it was very traditional and conservative and a lot of that those values that you're talking about now. The 60s really disrupted that. Yep. And then since then, we've been on this kind of- This 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 tear. Yeah, this run. And so from the 60s all the way to 2020, I mean, that's a long time. So the question is, if you feel like it's shifting right now, does it take another 40 years? <laughs> no, it might to be like faster. Really shift? That's a good or point. Do you, or do you think it will accelerate because of- Social media and the ability for that message. It to, might, yeah, but also might fizzle out, right? Pendulum might go bing, bing, bing. Back right, right. Like faster. it moves real quick one way, but then ah, yeah. that comes comes back the other direction yeah, we'll see. in one generation. That'll we'll be see. interesting. Um, shout out. Shout out the Build a Life program on the 13th. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, there we, you go. It's coming up. Remember on the 13th uh, at 6 p.m. at Mind Pump Media on Instagram. Tune in. It's live. We'll be building a brand new program. You get 6 p.m. Pacific Standard 6 time. 6 p.m. Pacific Standard 11, time. 11, 13. Is that a Wednesday, Doug? That is correct. There you go. Be, be there for the madness. Hey, look. You're not what you eat. You're what you digest. Digestive enzymes are what break down carbohydrates for energy, fats to nourish your nerves and your hormones, and proteins for your muscle. You need digestive enzymes. So if you're eating a high-protein diet, Use Masszymes. These digestive enzymes are designed for people like you so that the nutrients you take in go to where they need. It helps with bloating. It helps with digestion. And right now, they're having their Black Friday blowout sales. Go check them out. All kinds of giveaways, all kinds of discounts. Go to buyoptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump 10. Get 10% off plus the Black Friday deals. All right. Back to the show. First question is from CMOS23. Whenever I go into a bulk, it only goes to my belly. Any tips or tricks to make it go to my muscles? Yeah. Too much. Yeah. Bulk. Too much. To your, I think people, and you've said this, Sal, many times, I think really uh, overestimate how much they need to be in a caloric surplus in order to send a signal to build muscle. You pair uh, good programming with a slight calorie surplus and you're going to build muscle yeah. you and it does not take a lot and i think a, a lot of this myth has been perpetuated by the bodybuilding space because we look at their bodies and we physiques and we think they're the masters at building muscle and getting shredded and so we look to them as the advice of how they do this and quite frankly i think a lot of them uh, do it wrong they they and and you might be going how could you say that because they're the, some of the best physiques it's like well they are really good at building muscle and getting shredded, but for the average person to follow that as a strategy is really, really not smart because they put on so much body fat in the off season just to add a few pounds of muscle that for the average person thinking that this is a good strategy, it, they're, they're steered in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's two, it's, there's two reasons. One, your bulk is too high in calories, and two, your strength training program is not working. If you have a good strength training program, your body's going to want to take those calories it's going to shuttle it to and build muscle. muscle. If you're overtraining, if you're following the same strength training program where it's just not effective and you add more calories, you're not going to build more muscle. Yeah. Especially if you're overtraining. If you're just overtraining, it's you just add, store it. you'll just gain. In fact, that's the that's the big one is that you'll see people who are overtraining and then they'll just add extra calories and just get fatter uh, because it hasn't fixed the overtraining problem. So. In, in my experience with this, those that's the two places. It's like, let's look at your bulk. Yeah. Are your calories too high? 
And then the other one, which is typically also in play, is your your program. Your programming needs to change. Well, and is it easily digestible foods that you're eating, and it, or, or versus like, are you doing the high calorie thing through a lot of like ultra processed food? You know, like versus that, and like, is it giving you any kind of gastral distress? Which you know, any client I've ever had, like they're all they're they're going to feel like they're fat just because of that. Factor. So that that's a, a good point, Justin, and a mistake that I made in my early twenties when I would bulk is and and this is actually. Actually, I think also common is uh, people that are trying to bulk and put size on, they become infatuated with, I need to push calories. I just need to eat more. And they chase it at all costs. And then they neglect to hit their protein intake. Mm -hmm. And I was guilty of this, was just piling on the French fries, piling on the ice cream, whatever it was to add calories so the scale would go up because I just wanted to see the scale go up. And all I ended up doing was put on this body fat. And like I did the worst thing you could do, which is eating a caloric surplus and miss protein intake. Yeah. So then I'm not giving my body the adequate nutrients to build uh, muscle. And simultaneously, I'm eating way more than I need to. And all I'm doing is putting body fat on. So that too can be a, a challenge for people. But uh, in good programming, a, a good strategy is assess however it is that you typically work out, look up all the different MAPS fitness products that we have, and choose a program that is very unique or different than what you would normally do. That'll set you up for success on the programming side, and then hit your protein intake, and then you don't need to have a massive surplus, just a small, small surplus. Next question is from Candy Smith 87 What are your thoughts on calisthenics and combo resistance training? Love what's, it. Com what's combo You're resistance? Just combining it with resist with traditional uh, resistance like training. a hybrid. I love it. I mean, I, you know, I like calisthenics a lot because of the skill that you develop through moving your body through space. Like yeah. you get really good at calisthenics, you're getting really good at moving your body uh, around and there's so much carryover um, into the real world. It feels good. Um, it makes you more athletic. Calisthenics is strength training. Um, now it has some challenges. Um, at some point, certain calisthenic exercises yeah. like body weight squats, just it's they hard just, to progressively overload. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you're not going to build much more muscle now because you're doing, you know, 500 reps on it. So we should probably add some resistance. Um, but that's why you would combine it with resistance training. Um, I love them. I absolutely love it. You know, uh, resistance training in general, really refers to just using resistance in a way to build muscle, which mm -hmm. also refers to calisthenics. But calisthenics also very functional, great for mm -hmm. mobility, and great for health. I, I, I like them. Uh, we had a kid who r walked up to us at the summit that we were just at, at the health summit with Dr. Cabral, and he's the trainer, and his big stick is calisthenics, and he wanted to hear our opinion on it. And I said to him, man, I absolutely I love calisthenics. I think it's phenomenal, and you can get in incredible shape. Uh, the only limiting factor is if your primary goal is to build maximal muscle or and or strength, that's where it's limiting. But it doesn't mean you cannot build a very strong, fit, healthy, mobile, controlled physique. I mean, you can have a great physique doing that. It's just that if if you, our goal is to pack on as much muscle as possible or move the needle the fastest, you, you are limiting yourself by not using barbells and dumbbells. Yeah. That's all. But it, it doesn't mean that you can't It's have, most limiting with lower body. Uh, yeah. You can get pretty far upper body with calisthenics, especially if you use like rings. Uh, there's some really challenging exercises. There's ways you can manipulate push-ups to make them very challenging. But lower body, yeah, yeah, I guess you could do single leg pistols. But even at that point, you get really good at those. Now you're doing tons of reps. Um, you know, deadlifts, you can't really do any, you know, kind of posture chain, heavy exercise yeah, for the lower body. It's yeah, difficult. So it's it's limiting, especially for the lower body. But upper body, I mean, there's some great maximal strength, muscle building, upper body exercises. Yeah, upper body and core, you're, <laughs> you're going to have, you know, all kinds yeah, of options yeah. And there. definitely this question is in combo, and combo is the best That's of That's how worlds. you should strength train. I mean, when opinion. you think about it, we totally. do. I mean, uh, I use push-ups, dips, pull-ups. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. I do pull-ups almost every week. So, I do dips almost every single dips week. Are, yeah, yeah those, so those are three body weight exercises that I, I always include in my, mm -hmm. in my routine. Obviously, I'm going through something with my chest right now, so there's a little bit of that that's limited, but... Most of the time, this is I I would say that we program combo calisthenics in there with it. Just we probably don't go all calisthenics where you're doing you know muscle ups and some yeah. other great exercises you can, but absolutely the combination is is a, a wonderful choice. It's early access to Black Friday, all maps programs, all bundles, sixty percent off. Also, if you get a bundle, you'll get ten entries to win. If you buy a program, you'll get five entries to win. Everything else, one entry to win. Five days at the Mind Pump House in Park City. It's got a gym. It's 
got a cold dip. It's got a sauna. It's got red light therapy. It's all kinds of great stuff. Five-day vacation hooked up with $1,000 for travel accommodations as well. Early access Black Friday. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Black Friday for the 60% off and the entries to win uh, a vacation at the Mind Pump Park City House. All right, back to the show. Next question is from Fulvio Castle. What do you think about the new trend of emphasizing long lengthened partials? So anytime a study comes out <laughs> that shows that one part of a rep or one rep range or one type of tempo builds a little bit more muscle than the other ones, then you start to see this flood of fitness information that just focuses on that one thing. So it's like, oh, negative, the negative portion of a rep, that causes or that sends a louder muscle building signal than positives. So why don't we just do negative training? Or when you're when the in the whole rep range, the lengthened portion of the rep is where the loudest signal goes to muscle. Let's just focus on that. What that ignores is that the rest of it also builds muscle. All of it does. So negative rep builds more muscle than the positive, but the positive also builds muscle. Long lengthened partials, in other words, resistance in the lengthened portion of a rep. For example, if I'm doing a curl, the extended part, or if I'm doing a fly, the stretch part, right? That builds a little bit more, more muscle, but the rest of it also builds muscle. So why would I cut all of it out? I'm not going to build more muscle by cutting everything else out. Um, and if anything, I'm going to hamper myself because of the way that I'm going to gain strength now. The way that you gain strength is pretty close to how you train yourself to gain strength. So if I'm training in just this lengthened position, I'm not getting a lot of strength in the rest of it. So now yeah. I'm getting this kind of dysfunctional movement patterns because I, I think I'm going to build more muscle, which I'm not. So I think it's cool that we now have data showing that the lengthened position is a great position for muscle building, which to me says, hey, don't cut your rep short. Make sure you get the stretch at the end of your reps. So but don't don't cut out the rest of it. So they're like, what are they promoting with this like so you lengthen so you would, like this? So oh, if so I was like, in a like in a lengthened like a bicycle quarter rep from the lengthened position, and that would be a part, or of maybe you. a pause in the stretch, which is fine too. Yeah. Um, I mean this 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 reminds me of the conversation we just had at the event we spoke at, and we talked about um, the problem with uh, the fitness space is that. We have a lot of these science study nerds that are communicating information to the minority of people that need Very help. Novel. It, this is this is such a, a novel, and it's not that it doesn't have value. It doesn't mean that the study isn't yeah, true. Yeah. All that I don't disagree with anything. It's that it is completely irrelevant yeah. for ninety nine point nine percent of the population, and so even debating on uh, what we think or is it good or it's bad, it's like. It's so irrelevant to most people. You can never apply this science mm -hmm. and continue to apply the stuff that we communicate over and over and over on this podcast, like taking an absolute full range of motion, like sticking to a full body routine, like making sure that, I mean, that you, you have controlled you, tempo. You, yeah. Like there are so mm -hmm. many things that are so important for you to master and be consistent with that you could never follow any of these cool, neat, hacky tip, tips and, that, and build the most amazing, strong, good looking physique uh, without any of this. Well, so look, it's not, and, and it's not going to, it's, it's interesting. It's like, not going to hack you there quicker. They're doing little tiny reps with that versus just like enhancing your, the isometric, you know, tension in that position. So like it's say all it's it. a pause rep. It's all of it. They do that too. That, okay. Cause that, too. I mean, I would do that like, as opposed to little, you know, short quarter reps. But yeah, even, but even that, but even that, it's still a novel. I yeah. know, but but even to me, like I'm just hearing you describe that, I'm like, that's silly. If you look, if you do full range of motion and you're constantly and consistently challenging your range of motion appropriately, I want to say that because you can go beyond what you can control and hurt yourself, right? But if you're always training in a way to where you're trying to work in the fullest range of motion that you own, and you're constantly trying to get yourself to be able to improve ranges of motion within reason, you're going to get this. You're going to get the negatives. You're going to get the tempo. You're going to get all the stuff that they talk about and then some. Yeah. Um, if Emphasizing the areas where we see a little bit of a louder signal um, <coughs> and, and removing the others or dis discrediting the others is a mistake. And, again, and also, to Adam's point, we're starting to place more value on things that, uh, that, that don't deserve the value. Like most people, full range of motion. 
That's where you're going to get the most gains. You know who should train with yep. partial reps? People who, uh, very specific instances, need strength within a partial range of motion. Yeah. Like high-level athletes. High-level athletes, sometimes this makes sense. Like if you play basketball at a high level, quarter squats or half squats make sense. You're not going to go down to a full squat and jump. You get more performance by training in a shortened range of motion. Because well, you want you want to be able to generate the maximal amount maximal amount of force where that angle right. most applies to your your position yeah. in your sport. But so, this this reminds me of the negative. Remember when when the data came out to show that uh, it was the negative portion of the rep that built the most muscle. Yeah, yeah. So then you had people. There were I, guys. There were books. There were books that came out in the nineties. Of course, that were all about negative reps. Yep. You, in fact, you didn't even do the positive. You had your friends lift the weight for you, yeah, you and all you did were controlled, <laughs> crazy negatives yeah. because it built more muscle. Well, it felt it, it. It was a fad. It fell out of favor because it didn't give you better results than it doing. It wasn't the, one of the big rocks. No, it wasn't. It wasn't one of the top fifty big no, rocks. There's no. so many other things. In fact, I, I gave a tip yeah. in my uh, series yesterday about this. And I think this is a far more important point or tip to give the average listener uh, around strength. So understanding the strength curve of an exercise is important to so you understand what you definitely don't want to neglect. Obviously, if you take the advice of always going through full range of motion, you'll cover this. But I was giving an example. I was doing single arm preacher curls. Uh. And I said, let me tell you a mistake that I made, and I see people make all the time with this, is they're doing single arm preacher curls. And what they don't realize is the most valuable portion of that entire exercise is the stretch position of that. Yet you'll see some guy increase his dumbbell weight just so he could go heavier on the dumbbell. And then he ends up eliminating that 30 degrees yeah. that is the most valuable part you would be far better off staying light on the weight and taking that through full range of motion and then and then i said the opposite is true on the spider curl so in a spider curl it's when when gravity is is neck is pulling directly against the weight which is on the top the in top the squeeze part. in the squeeze portion but then you'll see guys go heavy there and then they they go halfway up the rep so they're neglecting the most important and valuable yeah. part of that rep and so understanding the strength curve and what's important now again taking it through full range of motion covers, covers all the bases, covers all the bases. Yeah. and that is why that tip is so much better than making these these studies and highlighting them as like hey you should do this. Wait, 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 the benefit of this data might just be this don't avoid the the lengthened part of a rep because you're trying to add weight because the lengthened part of the rep like a, like if you're doing a pull up and you stop short no no go all the way down get a little bit of a stretch and come all the way up yeah. you won't be able to do as many reps but you'll build more muscle yeah. as a result Next question is from Summer L. Wainwright. Should you do underhand or overhand barbell rows? What is the difference? Both. This became popular in the mid-90s because Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates, performed his barbell rows with a supinated grip. And he got this advice. Was he like the first person to do that? He was the one to make it popular. Oh, he was the, neutral. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was the one that was like, this is how I do it. Now, the reason why he did it this way was because he followed a training style that was loosely based off of the one developed by Arthur Jones, you know, Mike Menser being the other one, where you did very low volume and you went to failure and beyond. And so Dorian Yates trained with very little volume, trained with super crazy maximal intensity. But one of the things that Arthur Jones, Arthur Jones taught was, why would we put your bicep in a, in a position that is not advantageous? It's strongest when your hand is supinated, so it will allow you to use the most amount of weight. So put your hand in a supinated position when you do your pull downs and when you do your rows. And that was the thought process. Now, it's faulty because that's not entirely true. I'm stronger uh, with a barbell row with a pronated grip. I'm also stronger in the pull up with a pronated grip because that's the way that I train. But it doesn't matter. All those positions have some value. The supinated grip is gonna hit the bicep differently than the pronated grip, but it's a back exercise. Now, the other thing is that a lot of people in that supinated position don't feel very comfortable with their hands fully supinated while rowing. They just, it hurts their wrist, doesn't feel super good. And I'll say this, it puts the bicep in a more vulnerable position for tears. Mm -hmm. And you see this. In fact, Dorian Yates tore his bicep doing heavy rows with the supinated grip. 
But I think both of them are great. Well, I mean, you target your back different. When you are in, in a pronated grip, you're going to get more rear rear delt, more traps That's involved. That's from your elbows, right? Yeah, because of your elbow position. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. your elbow changes the elbow position, yeah. which is the but most- But it's not the wrist. Yeah, no, the wrist and, and the- But it, you just have to understand that if you are in a pronated grip, your elbows are going to be higher if your elbows are driving down here. And so you're talking about up here, more rear, yeah. more rear delt, more upper back, down low, more lats and rhomboids involved. Yeah. And so you get a little- To me, it's- uh, I do both. Mm -hmm. So I, I utilize overhand and I use underhand and I just look at it as a different exercise and not one is necessarily better than the other. I've never thought of it like, oh, this one's better than that. Yeah. I, the back is such a big muscle that I think we, we make a mistake sometimes of like generalizing everything as like the same the, the two, exercise. Yeah, you know? and the two things to focus on with back, uh, general, there's, there's more than this, but the two general things are elbow position mm -hmm. and whether you're rowing uh, horizontally or you're rowing or pulling down vertically. Pulling down vertically is going to be different than pulling towards my body from a horizontal position and then elbow position. How close my elbows to my body versus how far away. Those are the two main considerations that you should have when you're looking at your back exercises and am I going to work more mid-trap, rhomboid, rear del, or am I going to work more lat? Uh, it's all on those uh, on those two things right there. It's funny, yeah, listening to you guys because like I don't <laughs> identify with any of that. Like I just do neutral grip as yeah. much as possible, <laughs> and then sometimes I'll. You well, know, how do you I'll barbell row? Well, that's the thing. I, yeah. I do barbell stuff and barbell overhead press. You know, obviously. Yeah. But like, so it, if you were to row barbell though, you would do a pronated overhand. Mm -hmm, overhand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I typically don't do supinated anything except yeah. for like you know. If I'm curls. doing curls, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Which, which you really don't ever do anyway. Yeah, I did it in Florida. You I, know, saw I saw that. I was like, "What is happening here?" Yeah, yeah I think uh, I don't think it matters. But if you're look, if you're if you want full muscle development and function, you change them up. Then you're going to change them up and yeah, move yeah. them into different positions. Because yeah. what you'll find is if you stick to one and you don't do the other one, you get really bad at doing the other one. And so it's a good idea to kind of. That's how I've yeah, treated it. They're yeah. different exercises. It's they not. Uh, we're, I mean, the, when you when you change the position of the elbow. Uh, it now becomes a different exercise. And so uh, one, and they both have diff different things. About. I mean, the only time I really thought about it much is when I was bodybuilding and I was thinking about, because th at that, when I was bodybuilding, I was always- You're doing so much volume. Yeah, I was doing it. so much volume. And I was thinking, for example, like I might do a supinated grip because j the day before I really blasted my rear delts. I hit rear delts. And so my traps and rear delts had just got a lot of attention the day before. And so I didn't want- to put any more attention on them. They already got plenty. And so then I would tuck it in and get more lat. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. that. So that's how I made that decision on, but both are valuable. Both are targeting the back a little bit different. Not one is necessarily better than the other. If someone tells no. you that, I think they're lying. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible Six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.